And everyone, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Professional Satisfaction and Practice Sustainability webinar series. Before we begin, we wanted to quickly review some housekeeping items. This session will be recorded and will be available after the event. If you have questions, please place them in the Q&A. We will have time at the end of the webinar to answer many, if not all of the questions. Without further ado, let's go ahead and get started with today's webinar. Today's speaker is Dr. Gaurav Agarwal, who is an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences in Medical Education at Northwestern Feinberg School of Medicine and the Director of Physician Wellbeing for North, Northwestern Medicine Medical Groups. Today, Dr. Agarwal will be presenting on the Scholars of Wellness, a faculty development program to create wellness champions. Welcome, Dr. Agarwal. It's a pleasure having you with us today. I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to you. Thank you very much. I'm really excited to be here with you all today to share with you Northwestern Physician Wellbeing's program's flagship initiative that we call the Scholars of Wellness, or SO for short, with our tagline, Sewing for its development, the three core ways in which it serves as an accelerator of culture change, the nuts and bolts of the program, and our current data on its impact. I want to begin by highlighting the idea that creating an organizational culture of well-being is a journey. Uh, and I certainly I view my role as a, the Director of Physician Wellbeing here as empowering and engaging my colleagues to be active and constructive participants in that journey so that the culture we create truly respects their practices and meets their needs. I also try to really seek to find ways to accelerate that journey so we can kind of achieve transformative impact as soon as possible because that's when well-being becomes not something that we do, but some, who we are as, as an organization. The approach to achieving well-being has certainly been well delineated through various frameworks, uh, including the National Academy of Medicine's systems model of clinician burnout and professional well-being. It highlights the various system levels that influence uh, kind of the work systems and demands that we need to optimize to achieve professional well-being. It's certainly an elegant and comprehensive model, and I certainly agree that it is what we need to do. The issue, of course, has been for those of us who have studied this area for a while, it's, we've really noticed that it's difficult to execute these recommendations. Um, and you know, I'm a coach and using my coach vocabulary, my understanding of why it's difficult is I believe that's, that it's due to just because we know what to do doesn't mean we know how to do it. Uh, and so what, what we wanted to do is try to create an initiative that addresses that how. And so for example, many pieces of data suggest that engaging clinicians is important. Uh, and the ways to do this include involving them in decision-making, you know, designating champions and wellness leaders, addressing their burnout and creating training programs. But to me, designating you know, a faculty well-being champion or creating a wellness task force is an entirely different matter than making sure that those champions are actually effective uh, and have the knowledge and skills to be able to make good change. And so several reasons exist why your champions may not be able to actually uh, effectuate the level of change you'd like for them. First, there's obviously been an explosion uh, in the wellness literature uh, over the last couple of decades. And, and the truth is, there, in nowhere in medical school or in residency for most of us is, is this wellness science presented or understood. I think the second part is that even with the wellness science, you still need additional skills around project management, process improvement, and change management to really be a, an effective change agent. Once you understand and have some of those skills and knowledge, you, you begin to you know, dive deep into what are the, the general drivers of clinician burnout. And you see that there's you know, many drivers noted here for kind of the generic clinician. But it's not very long in that journey that you realize that you know, different clinicians have, have certainly very different drivers that are predominant for them. And that's not to mention just even different physicians of different specialties have quite different drivers uh, that are really fueling uh, either satisfaction or, or burnout. And so, you know, I guess at, at best as a psychiatrist, I feel fairly comfortable 
saying that I, I know the drivers uh, of the psychiatrists that I work with at my location. Uh, but even outside of that, you know, we're an 11 hospital uh, healthcare institution or an organization. And so if I were to assume that I know all psychiatrists uh, factors and burnout levels at all our other 10 institutions, it's likely that I would be uh, really skipping some steps and not thinking about all the design elements I need to, to include to make sure that I, I'm respecting the culture of each of our different institutions and making uh, effective change. I think the other thing is, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I've been on more wellness committees than I, than I care to share with all of you. And while, you know, we bring together really passionate people that have good intentions, what I have found is that over time, um, a lot of these wellness committees don't really make uh, the type of impact that we, we certainly hope they would have. And from my perspective, one of the major reasons around that is that a lot of times these committees and the individuals on these committees don't have a shared language, a shared vocabulary, uh, even a shared conceptualization of, of how they think about wellness and well-being. And because well-being means so many different things to so many different people, there's inherently this opportunity for miscommunication um, and inefficiency. And people oftentimes lack the focus and that consistent drive that it takes uh, to see a change project or change initiative all the way through to the end. And finally, you know, healthcare organizations often have at least some level of a mindset that pits the white coats against the blue suits. The clinicians versus the administrators culture can lead to poor buy-in, a lack of understanding of the strengths, pressures, and needs that each group has, kind of no grace or assumption of positive intent on the part of either group, and just overall a, a poor communication. I'm an occupational and organizational psychiatrist, and so my skill set is to help help workers uh, and workplaces reach their maximum potential. And so it was clear to us that the barriers that I've presented really were going to make it impossible to reach our potential as an organization. And so we designed, we sought to design a program to address these challenges, and we distilled all the things that I've been talking about into kind of three major things: leadership building local capacity and infrastructure and addressing the blue suit versus white coat culture, which we believe will help us achieve our optimal organizational functioning and maximum potential. And that program is what we call the Scholars of Wellness or so. And at its heart, it's a professional faculty development program with the objective to create a critical mass of wellness leaders that can drive meaningful change. And so based on what we have seen in terms of uh, uh, who can be effective to drive change, you re we really thought that you needed three sets of skills and, and buckets of knowledge. One is you had to understand well-being science. Two is you had to understand process improvement and project management. And three, and potentially the secret sauce, is you had to help people become effective change leaders and change agents. And the, uh, the Venn diagram center of those three is who we believe are our so scholars. The core objectives, obviously, of our Scholars of Wellness is two part. First and foremost is developing leaders that can be part of our physician well-being team. And two is each one of these uh, scholars creates a pilot project uh, in their own departments and divisions that help us generate new ideas and create a learning organization where we begin to understand uh, the, the barriers that it might take to implement certain projects, uh, the players that we need to involve and the stakeholders that we need to involve. And so these pilot projects really are, are great incubators for us um, in terms of ideas. Now, one thing I like about it is that the program can be flexed depending on the needs, readiness for change and resources that are available at any individual location. And so I'll present our most comprehensive form uh, of the program, which is it's 12 months long. Uh, the scholars are meet bi-weekly uh, during work hours to both learn the skills they need, but also use active learning principles to apply their new knowledge and skills to the pilot of their choosing. They receive funding uh, to protect their time so that they can, uh, you know, obviously improve the work unit environment uh, of our institution. And, you know, they're, they're, they also receive two coaches. One is a well-being coach, uh, is usually the director myself, and another is a, a process improvement coach um, that helps them guide, that helps kind of guide them through the implementation of their projects. 
The curriculum includes the DMAIC method of quality improvement that we use here at Northwestern, but there's lots of different, obviously, quality improvement styles and approaches that, that different institutions use, and I think they would all be very appropriate. We, we go over wellness topics, measurement um, tools, including both quantitative and qualitative uh, measurement options that people can use. Uh, and we talk a lot about how to build change, how to build buy-in, how to engage your stakeholders um, throughout the curriculum of the program. And so how does that program really address those three concepts that we talked about? And so first really is this idea of local capacity development. And you know, there's always this question about whether change is best done top down or bottom up. Uh, in my view, like most questions like this, uh, both is usually the best answer, and, and that's what we have tried to, to do here. You know, certainly, clearly having the commitment of the C-suite, having a chief wellness officer um, who's embedded in that C-suite and has that vision uh, allows one to take on larger scale projects than maybe you could otherwise do. Uh, but the truth to me is that the grassroots leadership has the ability to address a specific driver of burnout in a meaningful way that's relevant to a specific work unit in a, in a way that has more depth and precision uh, that really can't be understood by somebody from uh, the top down. To me, this has really uh, been a key part of the success of the Scholars of Wellness is, you know, this, this training champions that we really have embedded in all our, in so many of our units really help us as a physician well-being program assist them and create a consultation uh, model uh, that's far more effective. And so it's this kind of model of identify, develop, scale, lead that we are using as we develop local capacity. And so we, we, the Scholars of Wellness has an application process where we're really looking for um, the ability to identify people that have obviously are passionate about wellness, that, that's the necessary first ingredient, but do they have a servant mentality? Um, do they uh, understand how, they, they, how to make change and build consensus in their groups? Is that how they're looked at by their colleagues? We also assess that uh, they apply with a project idea in mind. So we begin to look at that project on, do they understand that the scholars of wellness is really about the work unit and organizational drivers of burnout? It's not that we don't think that the individual level um, is important or, or even the national level um, in the systems model, but our focus is on drivers at the, the, and interventions at the work unit and organizational level. So understanding through their proposal, do they understand that uh, and, and who we are as a program? We take these people that have this demonstrated qualities and we then develop them with our program, the Scholars of Wellness. Uh, and th this is where they learn a shared vocabulary in terms of how we as a program uh, at Northwestern conceptualize wellness. Uh, obviously, we've talked about the active learning component, the coaching. Uh, we help them you know, develop their emotional self-regulation as uh, anyone that's done this work for a while knows that uh, it, it is a challenging uh, a challenging endeavor and you're not always the most popular person uh, that you might think you are trying to improve other people's wellness and so being able to to be able to um, you know regulate your emotions is very important to that leadership in some ways this is a unique opportunity for us as the physician well-being program to uh, in some sort of way intern folks for ways that we can scale them in the rest of our program. Where, what are their strengths? Where would their, where are their passions? Where would they best fit in other initiatives that we run? Who has really taken our curriculum and, and, and immersed themselves in it that we really wanna see as a future leader um, that we can scale, whether it's at the department level or um, one of our hospital levels. And then for some of the folks that really just take uh, the bull by the horn, if you will, uh, we're able to scale them and, and have system roles, really be central figures in their departments as vice chairs, uh, take national leadership roles um, in, uh, in this area of wellness as we have an ACP uh, governor um, and certainly people that have been involved in their um, specialties, national organizations at a wellness level. And so you're seeing kind of the ripple effects of, of investing uh, in these scholars leadership uh, development and, and how that capacity is building uh, of people that can make meaningful change. I think, you know, one of the things we, we always face is when we talk about our physician well-being team, there's three of us, um, and, you know, you'll get some eye rolls that, you know, how much can, can really three people do? And, and the truth is they're right. 
um, you know, there's only so many people, three people can touch uh, and influence. And for us, that's where that local capacity development is so important. Because at this point, you know, we've been able to train folks um, and about 60 physicians overall through various initiatives uh, that, that are like-minded, that understand what we're trying to do. And when you have that, that's when we're really able to kind of unleash these change in agents across the institution uh, and accelerate that culture change that we uh, talked about in terms of our journey as an institution. We also have, the, you know, basically a scholar, as you can see, in most of our departments at this point. And so this really allows us to have this rich kind of bi-directional communication that is, is qualitative. But my, my sense is that oftentimes the data that I can get from our scholars uh, is as good or better than any sort of quantitative hotspotting survey allows us. And certainly in the middle of the pandemic, having people that were embedded in all our divisions was, was really um, um, something that allowed us, I think, to be uh, more effective and pivot in ways and, and go to the needs uh, that the people had. And so uh, I think that this idea of, of having local leadership embedded has been really helpful. The truth is it also is nice to always have a, a kind of a friendly, receptive face whenever we're offering our service, services as a physician well-being program. It helps uh, serve as, um, it helps increase utilization of our other services because people can go back and they know who their point person is and can talk about, you know, what else is the institution doing? How can I get involved? Um, and so it's, it's really been a, um, in some ways, uh, a great benefit that we didn't totally foresee going into it. And then, you know, there's been this idea that burnout is contagious and that a lot of our burnout, a significant percentage of our burnout is, is dictated by the team's burnout that we work with. And, and that's true. Uh, but the upside of the silver lining of that data is that just like burnout can be contagious, uh, we think engagement and fulfillment can be contagious as well. And when you seed one of our scholars in these departments, what we see is that the enthusiasm that they bring, the example that they set through their pilots, through listening to their colleagues about their needs, really is contagious. And it can kind of turn that tide so that others in the department really begin to uh, sense, uh, sense this hope that something can be done, something is being done. Uh, and that can help generate those small wins and that momentum that you need to, to really overcome sometimes the cynicism that goes uh, along with this well being work. I think the second um, bucket that we've talked about after local capacity is, is this idea of leadership development. Uh, as we've talked about, and, and is uh, pretty hot right now, is this idea of coaching um, in the healthcare ecosystem. And, and what we've really done here is we've selected uh, leaders and also frontline physicians that we are effectively coaching. Uh, as I mentioned, they both get two coaches. So we're coaching them on how they should think about wellness, but also how they can coach others uh, in, in creating um, a well-being environment and also just a, an approach to their own careers uh, that, that highlights and takes into account um, their individual wellness and their professional um, goals. Uh, so I think that has been really, really important part of, of changing our culture. I think as you, you really um, accelerate your leadership, that idea of speaking with one voice, speaking with how we conceptualize wellness. So for instance, the, the moral case is absolutely clear to all of us, but uh, when we talk about wellness at Northwestern, we talk about it in the, the conception of performance, being able to provide world-class patient care. And so when people understand that, we have kind of a North Star that we can all be rowing in, in together. Um, and I think we're just much more powerful as a group when we're speaking with one voice. We talked about this idea that there's a lot of emotional and social intelligence that goes into change, uh, being an effective change leader and building consensus. And so the coaching opportunities that I have with my scholars, uh, we meet once a month um, to you know, certainly talk about the program, go over the knowledge nuts and bolts, but a lot of that is really working on that emotional, social intelligence, uh, understanding who they are. And that builds a great deal of trust between me and my role as the physician well-being director um, that I think allows them to uh, feel like, you know, we really do care. This isn't checking a box. Um, and that I think has been really important um, as that message has been spread to, you know, potentially people that, that were skeptics about what we were trying to do here. 
big part of that emotional self-regulation that we really focus in on is helping people really reframe what's in their control, what's in their influence, and what's outside of their control. Uh, and the truth is our program is, is fairly new in the last couple of years. And so I think we, we in some ways model this because there were certain things when we were in our infancy that were in our circle of control and, and probably our, our circle of control looked like this little circle that you see on the screen now. But over time, as we've developed trust, as we've generated quick wins, as we build momentum, people are seeing that what's in our circle of control has increased. What's in our circle of influence has increased. And so they can see how, okay, if, if I focus in on something that sounds kind of small right now to me, uh, that's just step one of that journey. And so uh, in some ways that emotional self-regulation uh, is really improved as people stay in their circle of control. Similarly, we help them understand how to select what to work on. A lot of these folks have been on wellness committees in their, their departments and, and uh, have been burned, frankly, taking on something that's totally uh, not feasible, uh, even though it may sound like it has a lot of impact. It's not really feasible. And so there's a lot of uh, false starts and um, projects that don't actually ever take hold. And that can you know, further breed that sense of cynicism and, and take away that sense of hope. And so we really help people identify what are the quick wins? How can we really uh, strategize uh, for high impact pro uh, projects? And, and what do we really not need to spend time on that are low impact and low feasibility? Um, that's the, the rub of being outside of your circle of control is there's a lot of wasted time on things that, that really you never had the ability to, to uh, influence. And then finally, at all times, what we tell people is to have a, a service orientation to do something, right? There's a, a tendency to talk a lot about it, survey it a lot, and then nothing gets done. And then that feeds that, that cycle of, of mistrust um, in the system. And so we say, we don't really care how many people your pilot impacts. If it really helps three colleagues in your department, that's awesome. Like we're moving the ball, we're removing the pebbles in the shoe that are annoying to people. And you know, unfortunately, there's a ton of low-hanging fruit still. And so if we can really uh, you know, pick some of that easy fruit, that's, that's what generates that momentum and that trust uh, that will allow you to be more effective down the road. And then infrastructure development is what we're also uh, trying to accomplish with the Scholars of Wellness. I mentioned the idea is to seed um, our scholars into various different roles um, for different initiatives in our program. But again, their pilots really help us uh, try things out and, and fail quick, if you will, or succeed quick. And again, it's that same identify, develop, scale, sustain model where we're, we're hearing what's needed on the ground. We're understanding why it's needed. We're having uh, these pilot projects that people apply with that are really in their concept phase and we develop them throughout the program. We learn who are the stakeholders that are needed, who, who's buy-in that we need uh, to be able to be successful in this project implementation. Uh, what were the key success factors or, or frankly key failure factors, right? Pilots, uh, if all your pilots are succeeding, you're not doing it right. You should, you know, you want to have some stretch pilots uh, where you try some things that uh, at, a, at a local level, right? rather than me really rolling it out to the whole institution, um, that takes a, a, certainly a lot more work. If we can understand it at a local level, that can be important. And so an example for this is, you know, peer support is, a, is one of our foundational um, well-being initiatives. And so we started it uh, with two of our SO scholars in their anesthesia and OB departments. And they, they were able to stand up their peer support programs, help a peer support program that wasn't functioning very well uh, work better. And as we uh, saw how that was helpful to those departments, I was then uh, able to make the case to our institution that you know this is not one of those projects that really is local. This is uh, this is the price of of healthcare. This is an occupational hazard that we need to to give to everybody. And so then we were able in one year to scale it to every uh, physician at the Northwestern Memorial Hospital. And after we've been able to do that, our goal now is to, to scale this intervention to all 11 hospitals within two years of having someone try it uh, in an individual department. And so that's the accelerator part that uh, we have been really 
happy about. And I think it's how you can take little pilots and you harvest all, and that may not seem like they're making much change on the journey, but when you start harvesting all these fruits, that's when you kind of get this bountiful harvest. And so that's the idea of, of, uh, of the power of what we're trying to do here. Similarly, if you think about change management, you know, we want to make it easier for people that have a passion to serve to be able to do so. And so uh, our peer, peer support network is called the P2P network, peer to peer network. And, you know, it started off as support around adverse events, like many uh, programs like this around the country. But as COVID hit, we realized that we also needed to provide support around uh, COVID distress and, and pandemic fatigue, et cetera. And so we were able to, to figure out how to use our existing infrastructure and our existing peer supporters and have them pivot to provide support in that area. And that's really led to this idea that, that P2P is just an infrastructure platform that we uh, that's basically all things support. And so it can provide support around many different areas. And so now this year, one of our show scholars was working on providing um, an offshoot program that she's gonna call P2P Recharge that's uh, providing support around compassion fatigue. We're having folks looking at how do we pr provide support around physicians that have uh, experienced discrimination and harmful bias from patients and their families that we'll call P2P safe. Uh, and then providing support around uh, legal issues, litigation, peer review, uh, and calling that P2P pause. And so you have these offshoot programs that are far easier to get started because we have that infrastructure developed. Um, and and uh, that allows other people that have this passion of, hey, you know what, I've had this horrible experience uh, going through litigation. I know what that feels like. I want to help. We, we're, we can more easily fold them into our, our structure and, uh, and uh, use their passion uh, constructively. And then finally, you know, Scholars of Wellness serves as our core infrastructure and it's really portable. And so we started at our central Northwestern uh, Medicine Hospital and, and uh, over the last few years, we've been able to expand to all our sister organizations and have that be again, that flagship initiative uh, that can that can help uh, accelerate the journey of, of well-being that each of our institutions um, wants to make. And finally, we really wanted to uh, think of some way to improve this white coat blue suit culture. And in some ways, again, modeling is, is one of the most effective ways. And so when we run Scholars of Wellness, we have our clinicians um, that are leading, but each of us works in a dyad. And so we work with uh, our performance team. Um, and I, I model that because I certainly couldn't do this without my performance team uh, partners that are also serving as coaches for our scholars. But then, as I said, each of the scholars has a performance improvement coach that is designed to be someone who may be relevant to their project. So for instance, if someone wants to look at the EMR, their process improvement coach may be somebody from informatics. And the literature was really good about this is that when we co-create from the beginning, from the, from the start, when we are together uh, working on a project together, people really start investing. People realize that I rely on you and your expertise in these areas and you rely on me and my expertise in these areas, that's when we start to understand each other. We build trust um, and that allows not only obviously things to be far more successful in the year that they're with us and so, but those relationships last far after that. Now they have someone to turn to when they want to understand how to work better with their department administrator or if they have a new idea that they want to uh, pursue after. So, you know, they know some of the people that they can turn to for support or at least connecting them with other people uh, in the institution that may be interested in this. So really this alignment uh, with the greater goals of the, the institution over time is what we have seen over our few years. And, uh, and I think that that has really helped us create this culture where we respect each other's talents. We recognize that uh, I, I'm not somebody who knows all the, the science around project management and so uh, I should I should lean on my administrator who's really good at that um, and is, make sure that we're held accountable um, and that, that's really been a huge part of our success 
And so just how are we successful? Um, obviously to, to me, um, the pilots that we create and the leaders that we create are the deliverable. Uh, that, that's certainly my metric of success for the program. But, uh, you know, just looking at the numbers uh, are, is important too, is are we delivering the content that we, we want? And so when we look at those three big buckets of quality improvement, process, uh, project management, uh, you see the 61, uh, 61% improvement uh, in the scholar's comfortability from the beginning to the end of the program, and nearly 100% improvement in their science of wellness and being able to uh, drive change, collaborate, and be change leaders is 50% improvement in their comfortability in these three buckets. Um, we also looked at their burnout pre the program and post, and um, something we're very proud of, 60% reported their burnout had decreased. Uh, and, and one of the things that I, I want to highlight to you all is, yes, we give them um, protect a little bit of their time, but, but I assure you that the time and the workload that the scholars uh, are taking on through, these, through their participation is far greater. And so it, it just for me highlighted this idea that workload is not everything. It's important. There's no question about it. But when people are doing stuff that they're passionate about, that, that is meaningful, that they can visibly see is making a difference, that's the core of burnout. And so the fact that people's burnout decreased despite increased workload, I think, was um, a really important lesson for us. I think something else we're really proud of, 70% feel more confident in recommending Northwestern as a place to work, right? I can deal with a lot of punishment for myself, but you know, if I was gonna tell my colleague to work here, that, that, takes, that, that takes a lot of trust that they're putting into me. And so uh, we definitely view that as a, as a really important marker of that culture of trust, that sense that this is a place uh, that I wanna work in and that I would recommend other people's work, work at um, was, was something I'm really proud of. I love quantitative data, but I love qualitative data perhaps even more. And so just the ideas of some of the things that they shared with us is it enhanced my own sense of well-being, it engaged me with my health system. Uh, we recognize now that there are leaders eager to listen and help us collectively try to solve burnout problems. And, and that was really empowering to us. Um, I began to understand how to work with my administrative peers towards a common goal, uh, understood surveys and measurement and the science of well-being. And the camaraderie they build because um, the selection process is interesting. Uh, it's not senior leaders uh, or just senior leaders, I should say. It might be a, a physician who's just out of residency at the instructor level sitting right next to a full professor who may be the vice chair of her department. And so that there's not that many places where that happens. And so that camaraderie across different departments is, is, a, is something really awesome to see and helps people get out of their silos. And so all of this, we believe, has, has uh, been helpful to us as an organization, accelerating our journey as we recognize by the AMA's uh, Joy in Medicine distinction. Um, we were able to uh, get recognition from the Illinois Psychiatric Society as an innovative uh, uh, initiative for physician wellness. And uh, soon there will be uh, an AMA steps forward about how you might uh, consider implementing a, a similar program uh, at your institution. And certainly happy to uh, talk more with anybody that's interested. So thank you and certainly appreciate your time. Thank you, Dr. Agarwal. This was so helpful. After these next few slides, we will transition to the Q&A. For additional resources to support your physicians and care teams during this time, please visit the American Medical Association website. We thank you for your time today and hope that you're able to join our next scheduled webinar on Tuesday, February 2nd at 11 a.m. Central Time, which will feature Stacey Lloyd, who will present on a review of telehealth trends informing the future of virtual care. For general questions or comments, please email action.labs at ama-assn.org. After concluding this webinar, you will have the opportunity to participate in a brief four-question survey. We ask participants to please take two minutes to fill out the anonymous survey. Your feedback is important to us as we continue to develop future programming. Now we will take some time to allow our participants to ask questions. Um, again, please insert your questions in the Q&A box and give us a moment here to get our camera set up.
Thank you again for that, that all of that wonderful information. Um, we already have several questions in the queue. So if it's okay with you, I'm just going to go ahead and jump in. Great. Wonderful. Um, so you indicated that the wellness champions were selected first by application and then participated in a curriculum. How were you able to engage um, the physicians and promote participation? Was there any hesitation as to how their involvement may impact workload? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And, and certainly the first year you do this program, you, you know, it all makes sense in your head and you put out this application and um, generally uh, our experience has been physicians don't fill it out until the night before. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> the night before you're looking you're like, there's zero applications, this is gonna be a disaster. And so, um, you know, we, we just weren't sure. And I guess the, the thing I wanna make sure people hear is we actually had to turn down two thirds of the applications our first year. Wow. Um, there's, there's just that much energy around this topic. There's, there's a desire to make a difference. Uh, burnout uh, has impacted people obviously individually, but they've seen how it's impacted family members, colleagues. And so people want to do something about this. Um, we certainly had a communication plan. Um, one of the ways we kicked off the applications is we held a, a, a wellness day at our institution. And so we brought in a speaker um, and then uh, unveiled this application process or this, this opportunity to join. So, so obviously you're having a, a nice enriched sample of folks that came to the wellness speaker uh, who probably are interested in that topic that, that were willing to apply. We did road shows uh, to individual departments uh, and department meetings that to uh, un unveil the opportunity, uh, flyers around the physician lounge. And so um, those were different ways that we were able to engage folks. Uh, I think in terms of hesitation, certainly one of the things that we did was uh, the 5% um, time that was, that was uh, utilized. And also we said that, you know, we want to kind of model again and practice what we preach. We want this work to be done during uh, business hours. And so having that, um, you know, modeling that I think was useful and made sure that people could participate. Some people can't participate if we do everything at 6.30 or seven in the morning or seven at night. And so I think that allowed people uh, to participate more and, and uh, be really excited. But the truth is, I think it was really about the passion that, that people have around this topic. Yeah. Well, the fact that participation was almost too high gives me a lot of optimism. Um, clearly the physicians at Northwestern and are, are very passionate about this. So I don't think too much participation is ever a bad thing in terms of this topic. Um, I'm gonna transition over to the next question um, that also hits on hesitation or resistance. When you first implemented this program, did you face any issues with buy-in from specific departments or administrators? If so, how did you handle that resistance? Yeah, I mean, I think one of our principles is to include people from the very beginning. And so as we were creating this program, there were administrators at the table. Um, our executive sponsor is our president of our medical group. Um, and so, you know, we, from the very, I think sometimes we have a tendency to, to present things after they're fully baked in our minds. And then we're surprised when people are like, oh, you know, I would have done it different or I don't like this thing about it. And, and it can be uh, really discouraging. And, and so what we try to train our scholars and what we did here was people were included from the very beginning. When you fill out your application, you have to have your medical director or chair sign or, or write a letter of support. So already that, the, the, that department uh, is engaged um, and is supportive of this person. And so, you know, that, that leads to a commitment, right? Is we want that obviously our scholars to succeed, but now you've put your name to something and said, hey, you know what, I'm gonna support this person's project and who this person is. Um, and that leads to department administration and uh, chairs, medical directors being involved from the very beginning. And we keep communicating throughout the year uh, with those leaders as well to give them an update on what they're working on. Um, so we can continue to, to seek their support when we need it to get around certain barriers. Yeah, so it sounds like early involvement and continued communication is really important with this. Yep, absolutely. Um, I'm going to move us in a, a bit of a different direction with this next question. Um, in your presentation, you stated that you shifted the peer-to-peer -peer support aspect of the program as the pandemic hit. Um, were there any other aspects of the program that you had to change? Yeah, um, that's a great question. And um, so 
you know, one of the things I talked about was that camaraderie that the, the scholars build. And, you know, a lot of that has to do with, you know, you're, you're meeting together at noon and you're, you're breaking bread together and you're in person together. Um, and so obviously all that had to shift. And so all our, our lectures are virtual, have been for um, a while now. And so that was a big change. We had to rescope a lot of our projects because one of the things we know from change management is no matter if the change is desired or wanted, it's all change is stressful. And so what we have to do is really highlight the people that your particular project may not be that stressful, but it's about cumulative stress. And so if your project is going to require tons of buy-in, lots of steps, lots of meetings that are gonna engage uh, people or require a lot of other people right now, people have a lot to give right now. And so we really need to be uh, creating uh, or pursuing pilots that allow people to benefit without as much engagement um, uh, from them. So for instance, you know, one of our pilots was around team-based care uh, mm -hmm. two years ago. That's a, that takes a ton of work from a yeah. lot of people. And so that wouldn't be a kind of project we, we do right now. Yeah. On the flip side, I thought we weren't going to be able to expand to some of our sister hospitals, but um, I think the pandemic really highlighted the importance of this topic. Um, and so our leadership was supportive and in fact, encouraging us to say, let's go. Let's create so um, at, at our at other organizations. And again, we, we really weren't sure if people were going to apply and take the time in the midst of a pandemic. But again, more people applied than we could accept. And so just, again, uh, highlight the interest. Yeah. Well, you just hit on the next question, which asked about your expansion during COVID-19. Um, you indicated that you were able to expand to, to the other regions. Did it slow down your expansion at all? Um, did you have to sort of scale back in terms of your expectations for meeting timelines with that expansion? I wouldn't say the expansion slowed down. I would say there's a lot of groundwork that you want mm -hmm. to do. Um, and again, I, I just still believe the groundwork is best done in person. Uh, yeah. And so, you know, just building those relationships with local leaders, um, we wouldn't, our communication plan would have been different, I guess is probably the best way to say it. Um, yeah. But, you know, as many people as possible, again, know about what we're trying to do. Um, I think we've also been a little bit more prescriptive uh, with the projects that we're going to undergo um, in during the expansion. Again, really trying to hit that core infrastructure and trying to pick projects that aren't going to require us to uh, stress our already fatigued uh, positions on the ground. Yeah. Earlier, you had stated that you, um, you were able to engage a lot of physicians by putting out flyers and stuff with um, the pandemic, forcing us to sort of go into this virtual environment. Did you have to shift those communication techniques to, to um, sort of adhere to that virtual environment? Yeah, I mean, we, we still put them there. I mean, obviously a lot okay. of our colleagues still, still are, 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 yeah. are working on the front lines. And so, but we definitely, uh, we're more deliberate about newsletters and, and uh, writing stories about so, et cetera, uh, obviously using email to, to recruit um, because we know that there may be uh, docs that we're not able to hit that are doing telemedicine, et cetera. But, um, you know, certainly essential workers and a lot of doctors are still going in every day. So um, yeah. I think the flyers were still uh, effective. That's great. Um, so let's see here. It look, in your presentation, it looks like most of the wellness champions are physicians. Have you at all expand to engage other stakeholders such as APPs, um, perhaps engage residents for development opportunities or nurses, other people on the care team? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, my role, my scope is for um, physicians. Um, so I haven't, the program has not expanded to that. Um, we have a, a kind of a sister program that's around creating quality um, champions uh, called AXI. And that program has served as a nice model of expanding to nurses, APPs, and creating that, that uh, whole team that is being trained in this way. And so that's certainly um, on our radar in terms of the, the next step or the next evolution of, of so, uh, but currently it is only for uh, attending physicians, faculty positions. Yeah. It's a yes. big investment. You know, I think that's one of the things that, I struggle with is it's a big investment in terms of time, effort, resources. And so 
obviously the expectation is the year they're with us, that's great, but the dividends pay pay forward for the many years that they'll be with us, that we can continue to build and develop them in that identify, develop, scale model. And so one of the things that would be interesting in terms of how to think about that for residents would be, obviously residents may be leaving uh, after a year or two. And so what, what does that look like and, and how does that cause us to improve things? Yeah, that makes sense. Well, hopefully the everything starts to ease up with the pandemic so you can continue to expand in those ways and get more people involved. Um, but I can imagine that being a challenge, especially at a large um, health system like Northwestern. Unless I'm missing anything in the chat, it looks like all of our questions have been answered. Um, there are questions regarding whether or not the slides will be available. Uh, we will be providing the slides after the event um, in a follow-up email. Um, thank you for that question. So with that said, Dr. Agarwal, um, the Scholars of Wellness program clearly has been a success at Northwestern. I think the data speaks for itself. Um, so thank you so much for your leadership and continued commitment to the healthcare profession. Um, and thank you again for your time and expertise today. Very appreciated. No, thank um, you for the opportunity. Really, we really appreciate it. Um, we know people are very busy, especially during these trying times. So thank you again. To our participants, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we hope to see you again soon um, in another upcoming webinar.